So our next speaker is uh, Brent. He'll be talking to us about the industrial Internet of Things. Oh, hello everyone. So, um, the industrial Internet of Things. Uh, today we're going to be looking a little bit at how we can secure it and secure it against the emerging threats like pacemakers and other things that are just coming online for absolutely no reason. So, we're going to be doing this mostly by pulling things apart to see how they work. Cool. Now, the structure of this talk is pretty simple. We start in the future, we move to the past, we make our way back to the present, and then look at the not too distant future to see how things are progressing. Cool. Before I start, I just want to say thanks to Synergy for bringing me here, and both Serverlek and Adroit, who have helped in the acquisition of hardware for this project. Yeah. So I'm Brent, I'm completing a PhD at Rhodes University. Previously worked on unrelated things to security. Now I'm on security. Things are exciting. So, let's get into it. The future, as we've just heard, is actually starting to look a little scary. Everything wants to go online. And as things do, and as things progress towards services, people are going to be less technical. Things will be provided for them, and controllers and operators are going to just be people that operate software. They don't need to really know how these things work, and more and more we're going to see people just using automated systems. And really, we're not going to have too many educated professionals as much as we're going to have people just controlling things. Yeah? Also, there might be flying cars. We can look forward to that. Are we ready for the future? The previous talk suggests not. Yeah? Is industry ready for the future? I think we're about to find out. Yeah? So, a big portion of our research is looking at how do we actually go about securing industrial control systems. And, for me at least, this is, obviously, I'm doing a whole project on this. Um, we're going, I'm looking at industrial control systems and trying to figure out, you know, how is the best way to even decide whether they are secure. Um, do we treat them like computers? Do we treat them like websites? You know, what are they and how do we even go about starting this? Yeah. So, because I'm sure most of you don't actually deal with industrial control systems, I'll give you a brief introduction. Yeah. Industrial control systems basically, as the name might suggest, control large industrial things. Yeah, in this case, it could be factories, uh, petroleum refineries, power plants, water treatment, yeah? a wide range of things. And they're normally kind of in the past, they would have been controlled systems. Yeah? This is really what we're going to be looking at. Yeah? Looking back, things were a lot simpler. Yeah? For the most part, the average industrial control system basically was a sensor that looked at some kind of input, a controller, and some kind of output, a driver, a pump, a boiler, and it was a very kind of closed loop system, very simple to operate. Yeah? As things moved forward, they became a little more tricky, a little more complicated. And we've lost the microphone. Cool. Now, this is an old PLC, yeah? what we call a programmable logic controller. Yeah? Has anyone here actually seen one of these before? Wow, cool. So these are old, yeah? They pretty much were set up, you could code them, yeah? they had inputs and outputs. These days, we call them Arduinos. Um, this was basically just a really hardcore, expensive, hardened Arduino. Yeah? They were discreetly, discreetly connected, for the most part, individually addressed, limited namespace. They kind of were designed to be installed and solve a problem, one problem, in a very small scope. Yeah. Kind of as things move forward, though, we need them to do more, because we like things doing more. Yeah? We always want to do more with less. So they got infinitely more complicated. I don't know how well that's come out on the screen. Yeah. Newer PLCs, that was loud, have multiple network ports. They can talk to thousands of input and output devices at the same time. They can connect to each other. Some of them have wireless built right into them. And the trend is that we're moving more towards something that's actually starting to look a little bit more like a computer and less like an Arduino. Yeah? 
these hardened Arduinos are becoming tiny computers. Now, that's a problem because previously we've treated them like Arduinos. You don't have to worry about your Arduino <laughs> accidentally doing too many things. It does what it's told to. Your computer, on the other hand, is a bit more complicated. Yeah? So what this really comes down to is people like connecting things to the internet. As we've just heard, everything's going online. Yeah? And with connecting things to the internet, we have new threats. Yeah? Where there weren't threats before, we now have to look at things that never would have been thought of. Yeah? In a power plant, you never had to worry about you know, posters or who knows what else might be connected to the internet. Yeah? Today, everything's going online. Yeah? These are just some of the more bizarre things I could find. Some of them are kind of normal. Apparently, we have a toaster that might tweet, um, an egg tray, and a coffee machine. This is great. Um, I'm quite sure we all need to tweet about our toast. Um, but maybe there is a use for these items. It's not really for me to decide. Um, but the real question comes, you know, should everything be connected to the internet? And if the internet of things is everything, why shouldn't industry be on it? Yeah? Should our power plant not tweet when it produces another megawatt? Um, this would be nice. I mean, it'd be great. Fewer blackouts. But maybe not everything needs to go online just yet. Yeah? IoT is a problem. Yeah? When we think of why things shouldn't go online, well, <laughs> the things going online is why things shouldn't go online. <laughs> yeah? IoT is showing us that there are constantly emerging threats because people are doing this too quickly and just throwing stuff out there before it's even been tested, before it's even been thought of. Yeah? I've no, I don't know if anyone's ever seen a camera like this before. Yeah? You might have. They were on special on Black Friday. Yeah? Take a lot was throwing them out like mad. Yeah? Now, what's great about these cameras is um, yeah, there are multiple vulnerabilities in them. There's backdoor accounts, ships with it for free. Um, they've got all kinds of problems, pre-auth, you can directly locate them on the internet. Yeah. All the little red dots, those are those cameras. Yeah. As of a few months ago, more than 185,000 of them available online. Yeah. They have, they use what's called a go-ahead web browser. They can tunnel out of your network so that you can find them anywhere in the world from your cell phone. Very nice for you if you need to see what's going on in your house. Very nice for me if I feel like getting into your network. Yeah? This is a problem because this isn't one brand. This isn't one vendor. Yeah? This is the industry. Yeah? In the kind of RP camera world, this is just how things look at the moment. Yeah? We have probably got more problems getting shipped, then we actually have true solutions. Yeah. So we need to look at these. And I encourage you to look at them. Maybe not put them on your network, but buy them and play with them. They are really fun. They do bizarrely curious things. Like when you set them up, um, they require your Wi-Fi password and SSID. Now that wouldn't really be that much of a problem. So what you do is you type it in on your cell phone into their little app, and it plays a tone in the air to the camera, transmitting your SSID and password <laughs> in audio for everyone to hear. They're fantastic. Um, but it's devices like this that you can so easily attach to your network that are really looking to become a problem. Yeah? If you need a security camera on a site, looking at a plant, it's so easy. You can just buy one and plug it in. You can do it from your cell phone. I bought 10 of them. They're like 260 Rand each. Yeah? They're really, really cheap. You bring them in, you put them everywhere. And they now become a problem. Yeah. But back to PLCs, yeah? they're getting fancy too. Yeah? They are starting to look a little bit like computers. They have operating systems. You can put programs on them. Some of them have multiple network interfaces. Yeah? They can do SMB, they can do FTP, yeah? You can think of something your server does, this probably does it too, yeah? They're becoming quite fancy because we want them to be, yeah? 
But once again, this is what is causing problems. Yeah, maybe too much too soon. Yeah. Now, I've broken this talk into three steps. We will see how many of the steps we get through before everybody needs coffee. Yeah. Step number one, we're going to look at a bit about firmware. Yeah. In understanding how PLCs work, it makes sense to look at what's really inside them. Yeah. Now, I was luckily enough to be provided a Schneider M580. This is a massive, fancy PLC, capable of doing just about anything, it appears. And to call it proprietary doesn't quite cover it. Yeah. It's got network ports, it's got USB, and then things get weird. It's got proprietary black backplanes, all the software is proprietary, it's very hard to tell what's going on with it. Yeah. But it has an ARM CPU. Now, ARM CPUs are at least something I'm somewhat familiar with. <laughs> yeah. But the firmware itself, that's, that's actually something else. These, these PLCs actually run real-time operating systems, Wind River VX operating systems. Not quite so easy to just get your hands on these things to play with. Yeah. Luckily, we did manage to get some of it. We'll have a look at that. Yeah. But firmware, firmware is firmware. We can pull it apart. Yeah. Has anyone here pulled apart router firmware before? Less than I thought. Yeah, two, two is good. Yeah, you can pull apart router firmware. Yeah, Binwalk, the firmware mod kit. These things are great. Yeah, you can use them to have a look what's going on. Pull apart your router firmware. Sometimes rebuild it. Yeah, when you run it, you might get something like this. It might tell you that you've got some compressed data and you've got a file system. That's great. Yeah, Binwalk is a fantastic tool. You can take your firmware, pull it apart, and let you know what's inside it. It's not without fault. Here we have Binwalk telling us that I have got two VxWork symbol tables, one big endian, one little endian. It's a bit odd. Yeah. The most important thing being that this is, was not actually on a computer or a microcontroller. This is on a NXP microcontroller that I'd programmed to make an LED blink. Um, Binwalk somehow thought we had multiple kernels and firmware loaders on here. Um, so unfortunately, it does get things wrong. Yeah. But it is great for getting a pretty decent high-level overview of what's actually going on. Yeah, this, I don't know if anyone can actually see, this is more or less what a successful extraction would look like. Yeah, we can pull everything out, we can get our kernel, we can pull out our image, we can even pull out our files. In some cases, this allows us to do quite a lot. Um, I'll see if I can make these sides available afterwards so that people can actually look through this type of stuff. But basically, we can actually see what's going on inside our system. In some cases, like this one here, it even sometimes dumps the entire, if it's running a web app, you've got all the files for your web app. You can pull them out, load them somewhere else, and rebuild it. Yeah. Now that's quite useful when you're trying to do research and trying to build tools. We've got files, we've got file systems. Can we modify them? Well, sometimes. Yeah, the firmware mod kit is great. It says it can extract, modify, and rebuild. Sometimes, yeah. It's great with router firmware. It's pretty terrible with everything else. Yeah. But maybe we can do something else. How about virtualizing? Yeah. Once again, for research, these things are expensive. Yeah. A PLC could be anywhere between 40 and 80 grand. Yeah. So I might need more than one of them. It would be great if I could simply virtualize them. Yeah. And off we went. <laughs> Virtualizing things like OpenWRT is entirely possible. Yeah? We can simply pull down a router image, get it going with a network port, and on your box you've now got a router that you can log into. That's great. OpenWRT lets us do this. VxWorks is a little more complicated. Yeah? I've managed to get this to boot, it kind of goes in, and then it crashes. Yeah, unfortunately, VxWorks being a proprietary operating system operating system. In the beginning, didn't have too much information on this. Luckily, Wind River has provided us with a license, and hopefully, in the next few months, we will actually have a working virtual uh, M580. But certainly, this seems possible. Yeah. Having virtual devices would mean that we can have entire control systems running in one box, something that you could launch attacks upon within your own network. Yeah? Something that also isn't controlling massive amounts of industry. 
that you don't want to break. The next thing that I decided I would look at is whether you can actually program these devices remotely. And obviously we've got a PLC, we're putting it into a, an industrial control system. At some point we're going to have to program it, maybe update it. Updates don't happen very often it seems, but it would be nice to know that these things can be done. Yeah. So the first step was to look at how these things even get programmed to begin with. Yeah. Now, some PLCs get programmed over USB. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be a bit of a trick that they use. It's not, it might actually be a USB port, it's often running RNDIS, often a USB to network interface. It's actually just network traffic. Yeah. Now, network traffic's nice because you can look at that you can take out Wireshark and pull it apart. So, time to upload a program. Yeah, I wrote a small program. You just select what you'd like to upload, and you hit upload. Yeah? In this case, the program is not very interesting. It turned on a relay when I clicked a button. Um, that's all I needed it to do. It was nice and small. Yeah? And when I uploaded it, I noticed a few things. <laughs> it transferred all of the program over UDP. This was interesting, because yeah, this to me did not seem like a great idea. Yeah? There was no way to guarantee that packets were getting there, um, not easily at least, yeah? but they'd come up with a solution to this. The PLC simply responded to each packet, yeah? and provided us with what appeared to be a very lovely little pattern. Yeah, I've come, kind of somewhat simplified this, but at the beginning of every file that it transferred, we saw something that looked like that. You'd send a, a packet with a length of 46, and it would return a 60 to say yes. Yeah? Now, in this case, I'm using the lengths because the lengths stay constant in this. The contents are actually not too important at this point. Yeah? These were basically just treated as file markers. One signified the beginning of the file, and one the end of the file. Yeah? This was great because now I knew what files going over a network looked like. So, it was something, and we could start pulling it apart. So, I just ran, I took the Wireshark capture, I uh, wrote a little script that kind of tried to track the pattern, and just thought I'd give it a go. Yeah? I dumped the transferred data, and after putting it through something to visualize what was inside, we got something like this. Now, for those who have maybe not seen entropy graphs or content graphs like this. The blue is printable characters. Yeah? These high density areas would be compressed data. Yeah. Now, this at first doesn't look like too much. Yeah? But after we start reading the printable characters, a few things became quite evident. It was simply giving us files. <laughs> it actually quite simply gave us all the files being transferred to the PLC. Yeah. Now, obviously this is probably not too much of a problem. You program these things on closed networks. Yeah? But once again, moving into the future, when you've got a compromised webcam on your system, your network might not be as closed as you thought. Yeah? And this was at least interesting. We can pull apart these files, and because we've got the pattern, and we can simply use UDP, we can replay them, modify, and reprogram our PLCs, because all it takes is network traffic. Now, the other exciting yay moment was when I realized what else you could do. You could stop, start, run, reset, and wipe these things over the network. Yeah. Now, something that I must make clear at this point, a lot of what happens in the PLC world and in the industrial control world comes down to configuration. This was all, this was all capable because the PLC I was using had not been configured to say no to these type of things. Yeah? Unfortunately, that does mean that whoever sets up or installs these PLCs out in the wild needs to make sure that they disable these things. Yeah, we'd come down to operator fault and configuration. And this is a trend in industrial control that consistently shows up where things go wrong and where the vulnerabilities occur. If you don't turn off remote wipe, someone can wipe your PLC remotely, if they can get to it. Yeah? But as we're seeing, that's maybe not so hard. Yeah? Then, the next thing is, I did all of this using UDP. You can change that. 
And obviously, if we switch to TCP, maybe you're doing a bit better. There's probably going to be fewer corrupted transmissions. Yeah. You can also start doing things like segmenting your networks. You can put quite a lot in place to try and mitigate these problems. Yeah. But the truth is they're out there, and you've got to look at them. And moving forward, these are things that people should start to consider when setting up these devices, and more importantly, when placing other untrusted devices within a network. The next thing I wanted to look at was actually creating my own industrial control system. As I said, these are expensive. Yeah. Unfortunately, I did not get to attend Ross's talk, Docker for Hackers. I'm quite sure what I'm about to tell you is less exciting. But basically, Docker is fantastic. Yeah. You can just spawn up as many little nodes as you'd like, write a script, and if you give it a packet format, you can fake network sensors, fake actuators. Yeah? If you know a protocol these things talk over, you can put them up. And with Docker, the nice thing is, once you've got your Compose script, you just tell your computer how many of them you want. If you'd like 100 sensors, you just spawn 100 of them. Yeah? Docker is fantastic for this. You can do internal networking. You can then take your internal network and bridge it to a network interface and plug it into a physical PLC. Yeah? You can now capture what appears to be real traffic coming from real packets, real PCAP, and you can actually start to look at what is starting to look like a fairly real industrial control system. Yeah? Eventually, when this is coupled with some kind of QEMU virtualized PLC, we can start to create entirely virtual control systems that attacks can actually be launched against. Virtualized control system, real traffic, this starts to look like a tool that actually can be used in a lot of real research. Yeah. Now, as a platform for testing, this gives us a lot of options. Yeah. I mean, it might be fun just to know what happens when you throw Metasploit at a PLC. Yeah. These are things I look forward to finding out. <laughs> but in conclusion, what does this really come to? As I said, PLCs, they, they're not quite maybe something everybody plays with every day. Yeah? But the Internet of Things, well, that's, that's something that's starting to creep into all of our lives. Yeah? And we've got to look at protecting things. Yeah? Our industrial control systems control things very important to us, water, power. Yeah. Other than that, I think most people like cars. So petroleum is a big thing. Yeah. So we need to protect these things. Obviously, IoT is starting to look like a bit of a threat to that. So basically, moving forward, I'd like to eventually come up with a virtual control system that all of us can play with, that you can download and run on your own computers and start to get some real research going. Cool. That was probably short. Any questions?